Those of you who were here last week or have been linking in with the website or the weekly newsletter will know that we have started a new series that we're going to be looking at for the next few weeks and months. We're going to be looking at this story from the Old Testament that we find in the book of 1 Samuel. And Paul introduced us to our theme for the series, which is, if you like, a question. Who is in control of your life? And last week, Paul, if you haven't heard, didn't hear Paul last week, I strongly recommend you go onto our YouTube channel and listen. Paul shrewdly observed that it probably feels like there's one of three people who's in control of your life, either your boss or your spouse or the school run. I know how he feels. But you know, the reality is we all have to make decisions all day, every day, don't we? We all have opinions that we need to express. And it's a good idea to ask ourselves, who is in control of those decisions, the big decisions, the little decisions? Who is in control of what we think? Are you in control of what you think? Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. If you aren't, then who is? As we continue to study this book of 1 Samuel, we're going to keep asking ourselves that question. Who is in control of our lives? From a human perspective, the book of 1 Samuel is a book of change. It's a book of transition. It charts the transition of the nation of Israel from a theocracy that is a nation with God controlling it, and he did this through various men and women that he raised up called judges, to a monarchy, that is a nation where God was in, uh, where a king ruled over the people. That wasn't what God desired for his people, but it was what he anticipated they would ask for. And if you read through Numbers and Deuteronomy, you'll find there's a lot of talk about when you have a king to rule over you. After the events of the book of Exodus, where God miraculously rescues his people out of slavery, he leads them under the, uh, the leadership of Moses through the wilderness and to the promised land, Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey. We find ourselves in the book of Joshua, just as Moses was God's anointed servant to lead his people out of slavery. So Joshua was God's anointed leader to lead his people into that promised land. And in doing so, they were to discover what it meant to be God's people, to live as God's people in God's land under God's perfect rule. And there's this little phrase that keeps repeating itself, especially through the early chapters of Joshua, be strong and courageous. And that really sums up the theme for Joshua. And if you're facing tough times in your own life, it's a very uplifting and encouraging book to read. But, you know, if the book of Joshua is positive and uplifting and encouraging, its successor, the book of Judges, is probably one of the most depressing books we find in the Old Testament, if not the whole Bible. Because it charts this sort of repetitive cycle in the life of the nation of Israel. Israel would be doing okay, they'd be following God, they would win their battles, they would take the land, and then they would start to get a bit buoyed up with their own sense of success, and they would start to look at the nations around them and the gods they worshipped, and they would take their eye off the ball, and they would stop following God, and things would go disastrously wrong for them, and they would cry out to God in repentance, and God would raise up a judge, and the judge would steer them back to God, and things would go well, and then the whole cycle would start over and again. And I think about 12 times we find that cycle repeated through the book of Judges. There's a little uh, title that the NIV put right at the beginning of the book of Judges, Disobedience and Defeat. And that really sums up the book of Judges. Why does all that matter? 
because at the end of the book of Judges, we find ourselves moving into the book of 1 Samuel. And the very last words are the, of the book of Judges say, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. And that really does sum up the situation we find ourselves in, in the first couple of chapters of the book of 1 Samuel. At some point during the book of Judges, the center of worship in Israel had moved from the tabernacle, this mobile sort of tent slash temple that uh, was uh, moved around the desert to a more permanent location in a place called Shiloh. And we understand it was a more permanent structure as well. But, you know, the activities at Shiloh that we read about in the first couple of chapters betray the true spiritual state of the nation of Israel. In chapter 1 that Paul talked about last week, we have Eli, this old, old priest, who is unable to distinguish between a woman on her knees in desperate straits, crying out to do business with God, and a drunkard. And it is maybe reflective of Eli's own spiritual state and the spiritual state, I would suggest, of the average worshipper. Maybe it was that Eli was used to seeing people turn up to the temple drunk. Maybe it was such a long time since Eli himself had done business with God that he failed to recognize it for what it was. Next week, Graham is going to be talking to us uh, from chapter 3. And chapter 3 starts off by saying, uh, In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. And it's into this sorry mess that the young boy, Samuel, is introduced to us. If on a political level, the book of 1 Samuel is about the transition from theocracy to monarchy, perhaps on a human level or perhaps on a spiritual level, it also charts a transition between the declining Eli and the inclining Samuel. And then later on, we see the declining Saul and the inclining David. And as we, it's as we look at the lives of these four characters that we can ask ourselves, well, who is in control of their lives? And when we face the same situations as them, who is in control of our lives? In the chapter we're looking at this morning, we see these first fledgling signs, these first hints of the man that God is going to raise up just in chapter 2 a young boy, a very young boy, we're to understand. And he is introduced to us in the context of, I would suggest, three other characters. First of all, we have Hannah, and then we have the story of Hophni and Phinehas that I've kind of wrapped up as one person because they seem to be one and the same in their nature. And then Eli, through this man of God, this person that doesn't even have a name. First of all, we see Hannah. Hannah lived, I would suggest, a life of praise. And through that life of praise, I think she was remarkable because she was someone who was able to discern the spirit of the times that she was living in. What do I mean by that? Well, the chapter two opens with this beautiful um, hymn of praise. It's an outpouring of gratitude from Hannah. Hannah, desperately more than anything else, wanted a son. God answered her prayer and gave her a son. But, you know, this is more than just the outpouring of gratitude of of a thankful heart. This is more than beautiful poetry. This is Hannah looking at what God has done in her own life and looking at the life around her. And we understand that she was in the temple at Shiloh, so she possibly didn't have to look that far to discern the state 
that her nation was in, recognizing what God had done for her and recognizing what God could do for the rest of his people. You know, the context for Hannah's prayer is Hannah handing over her son. The the NIV just tells us, the Bible tells us that he had just been weaned. So that gives you a clue as to how young this boy was. But Hannah had promised to God, I will give you into his service. And she was faithful to that promise. And you would have expected her prayer to have been perhaps the prayer of a mother in distress and anguish, uh, having to leave her son in this awful, awful situation. Hannah, in her prayer, though, sees something much more significant in the events of her life. I think she looked at what was going on in the temple. She looked at the apostasy of the nation of Israel And she saw that if only the nation, the priesthood, the worshippers could turn to God in the way that she had, then perhaps God could do against all the odds in the nation what God had done in her life. And I guess Hannah's prayer of praise encourages us to think very carefully about the way that perhaps we praise God. Do we trot out the same old platitudes when we come to praise God? Or do we think carefully about what God has done in our lives? Why he's done it? What else can he do? Hannah's prayer starts off on a very personal level. My heart rejoices. My horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts. I delight in your deliverance. You know, Hannah doesn't leave it there. She thinks, well, why has that happened? It's happened because it's what God is like. It's what God does. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no rock like our God. The God who gave Hannah a son is the God who can turn everything on its head. And Hannah reflects on the God who can bring a dramatic and miraculous change to a situation where it's much needed. But, you know, as well as thinking back on what God has done for her and reflecting on the spiritual state that we find in Shiloh and in the nation, she sees it's only God who can make a change. And she thinks forward to the time when perhaps God's will will be enacted. He will guard the feet of his saints But the wicked will be silenced in darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. You know, the remarkable thing about Hannah's prayer that we have recorded right at the beginning of of this book of 1 Samuel is that it is, if you like, a praise of what is to come. I don't know how much of what Hannah was praying she really understood. It's impossible for us to know in the midst of her outpouring what God's plan was for his people. But I think we can say that we can see in Hannah's prayer her desire for God's will to be done amongst his people, just as it had been in her own life. We move on then from Hannah's prayer to these two characters, Hophni and Phinehas. If Hannah lived a life of praise, I would suggest to you, Hophni and Phinehas lived a life of corruption. Why was that? And I would suggest it was because in their lives, reality had been replaced by rituals. If Hannah's prayer of praise is uplifting and positive, the account of Hophni and Phinehas and their lives in Shiloh are depressing and negative. But we do see, I think, uh, a sign of the true state that Israel was in through the lives of Hophni and Phinehas. The worship of God in Shiloh was a joke. It was a sham. 
these two priests, Hophni and Phinehas, who were the sons of this old, old priest, uh, Eli, they were self-centered. They were greedy. They were oppressive. You know, we read that uh, years and years before, possibly centuries before, when Israel was in Egypt, God had promised the family of Eli, his ancestors, that they would serve in the temple, that they would help people to honor God and worship God, and they would point people towards God. And that should have been for them an honor and a privilege. And yet they saw it as a way to further their own means and to live an indulgent and deprived, depraved lifestyle. And we might shudder in horror the things we read about that happened in Shiloh. But you know, the reality is those things can still happen. And those things do still happen. How can it be that people who are placed in a position of authority to enable the worship of God can fall into such ways? Well, I would suggest the answer is very simple. And we find in verse 12, Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. Now, understand what that means. It doesn't mean to say that they didn't honor him in particular areas of their life or they didn't respect him. It literally means they did not know God. Quite what Eli thought he was doing by putting his sons who knew nothing about God in the position as priests in the temple, I have no idea. The priests were expected to carry out uh, a number of rituals in the temple. And if you want to know all about that, you can read the book of Leviticus. And there are a whole number of things. <laughs> Karen's got a wry smile on her face. It's, uh, reading the book of Leviticus is a good way to get to sleep at night if you find <laughs> trouble sleeping. But you know, it's all God's word. And it's all important because the point of all those strange rituals was that they were to point God's people towards a reality. And that reality was a God who had saved his people out of slavery and wanted to have a relationship with them. When the priesthood realized that all of their rituals were symbolic of a greater reality, and they used those rituals to point people towards God and help, him to under help them to understand what God was like, things worked out okay. Things were different under Eli and his sons. Eli, I would suggest to you, had forgotten the reality of relationship with God. Hophni and Phinehas, I think we can fairly safely say, never knew. And so the rituals to which those reality, that pointed to those realities were forgotten, or rather they forgot the reality to which those rituals pointed. Their religion, their religious lives became centered around a series of basically meaningless activities. What do you think happens when you take the reality of faith when you take the reality of relationship with God and you replace it with ritualistic religion. Well, I'll tell you, in 1 Samuel, we find one of two things happens. One thing that might happen is those rituals become the object of worship themselves. Instead of using those rituals to worship a God who is real and living, you worship the rituals the rituals become deified. And that is what we find happens in a few chapters' time. The other thing that happens is that the rituals become desecrated. And that is exactly what happened with Hophni and Phinehas. They became bored with what they were doing. It meant nothing to them. And they decided that following their own human, depraved and greedy desires was much more interesting and much more important. And so we find that Hophni and Phinehas stole from the worshippers. What did they steal? Well, they stole the meat. 
We find an interesting detail here because it had become the custom that the priest could come and he could plunge his fork into the pot of boiling meat and whatever came up on the end was there for the priest to eat. And that was right and proper. The priest served in the temple. He couldn't go out and earn money to buy food. And so there was provision for God to provide for the one who was offering his service. But I suspect that most of what came up on the end of that three-pronged fork didn't look very appetizing. What Terry Pratchett would have called grey meat with tubes. Hophni and Phineas decided they wanted their meat roasted. And they didn't want any old meat. They wanted the choicest cuts. Now, when you have a nice cut of meat and you want to roast it, you want to make sure there's plenty of fat around it because that's what gives it flavour and stops it from drying out. But the fat was to be burned as an offering to God. They desecrated the ritual because they didn't understand the reality towards to which that ritual pointed. When the worshippers objected, things turned nasty. And worse than that were the sexual habits. Surely those things would never happen in our church today, though. Well, do you know, they can and they do happen. When we become more interested in doing church than in being the children of God. When all that stuff, that yes, it's important, but not, uh, if you like, it doesn't sum up what we are and what we're about. All the, all the stuff we do in church, when that replaces our relationship with God, we find Actually, we've somehow replaced the reality of relationship with God with what has become a ritual. You know, we're not a church that is big on rituals. Um, we were having a meeting a little while ago, and someone said, well, what kind of a church? How would you sum up what we are as a church? And I thought, well, we're a church that takes things very seriously, but in a lighthearted and informal kind of way. We don't have lots of rituals. We have a couple, don't we? We have baptism and we have communion. Both of those are important. Both of those are commandments that Jesus gave us in his word. If we are serious about following God and about being uh, obedient to his word, they are not optional extras. But, you know, we have to be careful because both of them are, are symbols that point to a reality. What's important is the reality and not the symbol that points towards it. That's just two things. You know, we're good at creating our own rituals, aren't we? About 20 years ago, and uh, I won't bore you with the length of the story, which I'm quite good at doing, this church underwent a dramatic change very, very quickly. All sorts of things happened that were catalysts for this. And our Sunday morning services changed dramatically. And after about three weeks, somebody said, oh, no, we won't do that on Sunday morning because it's not what we do. In three weeks, we had made a tradition as a church of what we did on a Sunday morning, having broken free from probably 50 or 60 years' worth of tradition, and been so pleased and proud of ourselves that we'd broken free. In three weeks, we'd replaced it with another tradition. We're great at creating our own rituals. You know, at the, ev at the bottom of everything we do as church, at the bottom of everything we think, everything we say, everything we believe, should be the fact that we are God's children. We are loved by God, we are saved by God. We are forgiven by God. We are rescued from all the things that we've got wrong, all the mistakes we've made. And he has brought us into this wonderful thing, the church, God's family. And you know, that was exactly as true as it was for the people at Shiloh, as it is for us today. The moment our spiritual life 
becomes focused on anything other than that, we find ourselves on a slippery slope. And I would suggest at the bottom of that slippery slope, we find characters like Hophni and Phineas. The third person we see, of course, is Eli. Eli, we see uh, reflected on, his, his life is reflected on by this unnamed character, this man of God. It was uh, common parlance for a prophet. And this prophet, this man of God, brings a damning indictment regarding the worship in the temple at Shiloh. Not this time of Hophni and Phinehas, but this time on their father. It doesn't seem like Eli indulged in the wayward practices of his sons, but it does seem that he is guilty of something which is probably far worse. And that is apathy. In the light of all that God has done for him and his family. And it seems to me that Eli stands in stark contrast to Hannah. Hannah's response to God's goodness towards her and her family was to give back to God what God had given to her. Eli's response to God's goodness was exactly the opposite. The m- <laughs> that woke you all up, didn't it? <laughs> It seems uh, the man of God challenged Eli that he honoured his sons more than he honoured God. Hannah honoured God more than her very, very natural maternal desire to take her son home to live up with, to grow up with her in her own household. But, you know, God had run out of patience. And he reminds Eli of all the promises that he made to his family. And then he says, those promises have come to an end. He promised Eli's family that forever they would serve before him in the temple. God says, not anymore. Which raises a difficult question, doesn't it? Can we trust God's promises? Are God's promises not trustworthy? Does God lie when he says, makes promises towards us? You know, the Bible is full of promises to us as his people. Are those promises that God can be trusted on to fulfill? Did God not know what Eli was going to do? I would suggest to you, we need to be very careful how we understand God's promises to us. His promises, I think, should always be understood in the light of his purposes. You know, God made a promise to the family and the house of Eli on the understanding that they would honour God and they would point people towards God through their work in the temple. They would help the nation to grow in faith. They would help the nation to grow in their understanding of what God was like. But they had completely failed to do that. In fact, you could say of Hophni and Phinehas, they hadn't even bothered to try. The worship in Shiloh was a joke. The people, understandably, had become bored and disillusioned with God, with trying to worship God. The purposes of God for his people had not just been sidelined, they had been completely ignored. And so God declares through this prophet to Eli, those who honour me, I will honour. But those who despise me, I will disdain. But there's something wonderful in all of this as well. You know, just with the predicted end of the house of Eli... And Hophni and Phinehas, we find God's plans and purposes hadn't been derailed at all. In fact, in terms of the greater story of 1 Samuel, they were just about to get going. If we are not going to honour God in the work that he has given us to do, 
if we are not going to submit to his plans and his purposes for our lives and the lives of his people around us, it might just be God decides we are better off out of the way and off the scene. God is utterly committed to his plans and purposes and he won't allow anything to stand in their way. But just as he brings the priestly office of Eli and his family to an end, so he raises up another who will be faithful to his purposes. You know, three times in chapter 2, there's a little word that repeats itself, but. And you know, sometimes in Scripture, after the word but, we find God does the most amazing things. But God, the word on which everything changes. Elkanah went home to Ramah, the inference being everything was about to go back to normal. But the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord and under Eli the priest. The sins of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. Things had got just about as bad as they could possibly be. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord. Eli and his sons had failed. The priestly office was about to be wiped out. God had a plan, and he says, but I will raise up for myself a faithful priest. Our subject this morning is growing up against the odds. And you know, maybe as you've heard about the events in Shiloh and the lives of Eli and Hophni and Phinehas and the atmosphere which Samuel was growing up in, you can identify with that. Maybe you feel you are growing up against the odds, that you come from a background which sets you against the odds. You know, you've tried to dedicate your life to God, to doing his work in your life, to following his plans and purposes, and yet you've come out of an environment which is so unlikely, the sort of environment which on a human level, you might say, makes spiritual growth almost impossible. What are the secrets of growing up against the odd? Well, very quickly, as we close, I just want to say three things that we can learn from Samuel. First of all, know who you are serving. We read, the boy ministered before the Lord. What does it mean to minister? You know what that word, little word minister means? It just means to serve. A ministry is a job in which you serve. A minister is one who serves. And maybe it feels like it's impossible for you to do anything for God because of the situation you're in, because of your background, because of the atmosphere you find yourselves in. Maybe it is you just need to serve. You just need to get on and do something for God. But remember who you're doing it for. Serving God. Not serving people in the church who perhaps seem important. Not pleasing people who you want to please, but serving God. You know, we live for an audience of one. There's lots of people watching what we're doing, but there's only one person watching who counts. Either, uh, Samuel served before the Lord. There is something else, though, because it goes on and says, Samuel served before the Lord under Eli the priest. I think that's important. Just as Samuel served the Lord, he did so under the authority of someone else under the authority of Eli the priest. And it may well have been, you say, that Eli didn't deserve that authority. And I would agree with you. But Samuel placed himself under somebody's authority. You know, it is very important that whatever we do in church, whatever we do for God, we are accountable to somebody else. 
there is somebody else who can come alongside us and yes, sometimes encourage us, but yes, sometimes to question us and challenge us and, well, why are you doing that? Do you think that's the right thing to do? You know, there are people, and I've seen this many, many times, who decide that God has told them they're going to do something and God has laid this burden on their heart to carry out this ministry. But, you know, they don't really need a team of people around them, and they don't need to be in submission to anybody else. It's not a word we like, is it? Submitting and submission. And so they're just going to do this work for God. And they're not going to be accountable to anybody. I would suggest, if that is what you decide you're going to do, at best, your ministry will be weak, ineffective, and probably short-lived. We serve God, but we need to be accountable to people around us. Secondly, know that God is for you. In 2 Samuel 35, right at the end of the chapter, we read, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will establish his priestly house. You know, Samuel was not in Shiloh by mistake. It was no happy accident that Hannah had prayed to God for a son and God had answered her prayer. It was no happy accident that God had placed on Hannah's heart a burden to give back to God what he had given to her. All of these things happened because God had ordained that they would happen. Even the stubborn refusal of Hophni and Phinehas to listen to their father, we understand, was ordained by God. Why? Because God is committed to his plans and purposes. Nothing that happens to us happens by accident. You know, Christians don't have coincidences. Things happen because God makes them happen. If you're here this morning listening, it's because God wants you to be here. If you're listening online, it's because God has ordained that that would be so. If you have set your heart on serving God, despite coming out of perhaps the most difficult of circumstances, know that God has ordained that all that would happen. And that God, like he raised up Samuel, has raised you up for a time and a place and a purpose. And that God is for you. You know, I don't know all of your stories. I know one or two of you. But I know that many of you have determined that you're going to serve God where you are in your life. And you've decided that you're going to do that come what may. And you could have said, well, I can't possibly serve God in, in the atmosphere of corruption and theft, perhaps spiritual apostasy like we find at Shiloh, violence, sexual abuse, maybe. You could say, with all these things against me, how can I possibly serve God? You know, the Apostle Paul was not a very likely person to serve God. In the beginning of the book of Acts, we find that the Apostle Paul was hell-bent against killing Christians and destroying the Christian faith. Paul said of himself, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee, the chief of sinners. And yet when he wrote to the church at Rome, he says, we know that in all things... God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What shall we say then in all these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? What shall separate us from the love of God? Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, a sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will separate us from the love of God. If you have determined to carry out God's will in your life, it doesn't matter what else is going on. Know that God is for you.
And lastly, trust in God's purpose for your life. You know, a few weeks ago, Glynn preached to us on giving, or to be more precise, he preached to us on giving back to God out of what God has given to us. And, you know, Glynn said something which um, struck me very deeply. He said, one of the things that scares the devil most is when Christians give to God because they want to see God's kingdom grow. In other words, the devil is scared when foremost in our mind, foremost in our lives, we have God's plans and God's purposes, and we will do anything to see those happen. Glynn reminded us in the Old Testament, we read the story of Solomon. Solomon was asked by God when he became king, you can have anything you want. And Solomon very wisely asked for wisdom. He was commended by God for it. And uh, Glenn reminded us that because he asked for something that was in line with God's plans and purposes, God granted him so much more. There is no parallel story in the book of Samuel. We don't have an account of God saying to Samuel, Samuel, what would you like and I'll grant it to you. But, you know, if there was... I would suggest Samuel's answer would have been this. I want to live out your purposes for my life, and I want to see your purposes fulfilled in this nation. Samuel, that tiny little child, didn't have much to offer God, but what he did have, he turned around and gave back to God. You know, in the story that Graham is going to be talking to us about next week, we read... God says to Eli, through the boy Samuel, see, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. And I think Samuel, as he was relaying those words to Eli, thought, yeah, I want a bit of that. I want to be part of what God's doing. Yeah, I don't really understand what God's saying here, but I know that it's going to be something good and it's going to be something different and it's going to be something of God. And I want to play my part in it. Do you want to be part of what God's doing? Do you want to play your part? It might be a big role. It might be a small role. But it's a role that God has cut out for you. Because if you do decide you want to, God will take all those barriers, all those things that make it seemingly impossible for you to serve him, and he can put them to one side. God can take all the things that we put up as reasons for not serving him. And he can work through those in the lives of those who are determined to see his will done at any odds. You know, we don't know much about the boyhood of Samuel, but the end of chapter three finishes with an amazing count of where Samuel had moved to, the tiny little child just weaned, growing up against the odds in an atmosphere of corruption and sexual abuse and apostasy and theft and fuggery. And at the end of chapter 3, we read, The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground, and all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. Do you want to be a part of what God is doing? Commit to doing that. God will take all those things that you think stand in the way of you serving God, and he will deal with them if you commit to the plans and purposes of God in your life and in this church, in this community, and in this generation. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for stories of people like Samuel, just a tiny boy, not much more than a toddler, 
and yet one who was determined to see your will done in his life and in the lives of people around him. We thank you that you have established your plans and purposes for your people and that they're good plans and good purposes. Heavenly Father, will you help us when life seems to conspire against us to keep our eyes focused on you, the one who controls the Alpha from the Omega, the beginning from the end, the one who is the author and perfecter of everything we believe. Help us to become more like you in everything we do and say, every day and in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.